I'm Rob Trusinski. This is Salon of the Refused, where we talk about ideas that are outside the mainstream. My guest today is Stephen Pinker, a professor of psychology at Harvard and author of a number of uh, widely selling books. And the most recent one, which I'm going to be talking to him about today, is Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Now, I... I we talk about this show being about ideas that are outside the mainstream. Now, you're a professor at Harvard. You've had some best-selling books. That's not exactly so far outside the mainstream, but there's one cause that you've been advocating that is definitely goes against the grain and against the mainstream in the media, in politics, uh, in even in, in academia and among the intelligentsia, which is that last part of your subtitle, The Case for Progress, the idea that the world is a whole lot better now than it has ever been. Yeah, you wouldn't think that that would be a particularly controversial idea, nor reason, science, uh, or for that matter, humanism, defined as promotion of human flourishing. But I, I felt compelled to write the book because it's they're more controversial than one might think. And, and as you noted, progress is the most controversial among the four. There's uh, although this was not always true in in uh, intellectual mainstream, but now it's uh, very hard to find people who would uh, acknowledge that the world is getting better, uh, even though, as I argue, the data uh, unmistakably show that it is. Well, you go in your book, uh, and the thing I think is most interesting about your book is you go on at great length with charts and graphs. Now, I'm a sucker for charts and graphs, but I think it's necessary for showing for hammering this point in against you know the the sort of doom and gloom you go over a whole bunch of different issues longevity and uh uh wealth and health and all the different issues uh that uh all the different data that demonstrates that human life is getting better uh -oh. uh, that's right. Uh, recapitulating my own epiphanies because uh my my track record certainly wasn't one of uh, of uh, uh, indiscriminate uh, optimism. Quite the contrary. I wrote a book called The Blank Slate to talk about uh, uh, ideas outside of the mainstream. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, I defended the idea that there is such a thing as human nature in defiance of a widespread belief in the blank slate, the idea that, there, that uh, all of human nature is inscribed by the environment, by parenting, by culture, by the media. Uh, and that has been associated with a certain kind of uh, fatalism or pessimism. You can't change human nature, uh, even a certain kind of uh, reactionary politics. Why even bother trying to uh, eliminate war if uh, war is in our genes and, and always will be? Mm. Uh, I myself uh, acknowledge, even in the blank slate, but even more so afterward, that if you just look at data on, uh, say, rates of war over time, you see that there has been a, uh, a pretty dramatic decline. Uh, since 1946, the rate of death in warfare has gone from uh, more than 20 per 100,000 per year to less than one per 100,000 per year. Uh, if you look at the uh, rates of um, a homicide, uh, it has come down by a factor of about 30 or 35 since the Middle Ages. If you look at violence against women, if you look at violence against children, if you look at institutional forms of violence like slavery, capital punishment, corporal punishment, uh, all of them have come down. Facts that you can't appreciate from the news because unless uh, something has vanished from the face of the earth, there'll always be enough incidents to fill the news. Right. Uh, it's only when you look at the denominator, uh, how many countries are not at war, uh, how many people uh, don't get killed, uh, that you uh, can appreciate the progress that we've made. So my own uh, intellectual autobiography was one of coming to realize that there's human progress by looking at these surprising graphs. And so that's the way I made my case in Enlightenment Now and in the previous book, The Better Angels of, of Our Nature, which concentrated on violence. Right. You know, it's a bit of the case of the dog that, that didn't bark. You know, the uh, it's hard. It doesn't get picked up in the news because it's about something that has stopped happening. Whereas, you know, the dramatic things on the on the television are the things are the bad things that are happening. Uh, even if there are fewer bad things, it's still the bad things that are happening that make for drama on the TV. That's right. You, you never see a journalist saying I'm reporting live from a country that's at peace <laughs> or a city that's not been shot up by terrorists or a country that's not having a famine. And if there are more and more countries that uh, are, are not at war and don't have famines, it's it's invisible because it never yeah. makes the news. It's only the graphs that can, uh, can show you that major fact of uh, human history. Well, that that leads me to another question, which is I'm going to put this question the way I normally get it, which is uh, 
how can you be such a monster as to look at numbers and facts and figures and statistics when <laughs> I could tell you the stories of individual people who are suffering? Right. Uh, the thing is that it's better that fewer people suffering than, than, uh, than if there are more people that are suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as you use words like better, worse, more, less, improve, deteriorate, you're already making a uh, quantitative claim. And it's just a question of whether you back up your claim or you just make it on the basis of personal uh, authority. Right. Well, and I also think that this gets to beyond the in, in the media, beyond the if it bleeds, it leads kind of effect. There's also the fact that in the media and in, in academia and intelligentsia, there tends to be a, a narrative style of thinking that you, to, you think by telling stories. And so that leads to the sort of reasoning by anecdote. Well, I met this person, you know, who was upset about China taking away our jobs, or I met this person who was upset because they didn't get health insurance. And, you know, you reason from those uh, uh, anecdotes and from those stories, as opposed to the method of science, which is putting aside the anecdotes and, and, and reasoning from numbers and, and measurements and, and uh, statistics. Uh, quite right. And of course, the uh, approach of arguing by, by anecdote, by narrative, by image meshes with the feature of our own cognitive psychology, namely right. the availability heuristic by which we judge risk, probability, um, uh, danger, frequency by consulting our own imaginations. The more quickly something pops into mind, the more frequent we judge it to be in the world. And, you know, that, that sometimes works. It, it's true that... Uh, that, that sparrows really are more common than uh, than, than red-breasted nuthatches. So if you uh, go by your stereotype in a lot of uh, realms of everyday life, you'll, uh, you'll you'll be making roughly accurate judgments. When it comes to things where our own personal experience may not be a good guide to frequency in the world, such as wars taking place in other continents, then consulting your own memory, your own imagination could lead you seriously astray. But it is the natural way for people to reason and to argue. One of the things that struck me most in your book is the uh, you list longevity and wealth and wars and, and these material factors. And one of the things you'll get back from, especially from the conservative side is, well, sure, we have more cheap stuff from China, but you know, morally, spiritually, we're degraded, we're, we're decadent. But one of the things that struck me from your book is you go over a lot of the ways in which we are spiritually better off. Uh, education and leisure time and uh, availability of art and culture. Uh, precisely. Uh, that it's something we take for granted, as we take for granted many of our, our blessings. But the fact that I can watch uh, a great film by you know, Truffaut or Bergman or, uh, or, or Hitchcock uh, or Godard, uh, at, with a, a few clicks of a mouse, whereas uh, uh, not so well in a major city, and then you have to be lucky for it to be shown in a repertory theater, and so on with great speeches of history, great musical compositions, great works of art. If you were lucky, you'd get kind of a muddy black and white reproduction. Now you can <laughs> see it in glow, glowing color on, on, on a screen. So access of the great works of humankind has never been more available. Uh, travel, most people would consider the ability to venture more than a few miles from your birthplace and see the, the wonders of the world to be one of the things that makes life worth li living. With the plunging cost of, of airfare, um, uh, air travel is no longer uh, confined to the jet set, in, to use an anachronistic term, uh, but everyone belongs to the jet set. And, and uh, likewise, there are other uh, moral uh, dimensions of our experience that have, have clearly been enhanced. The fact that uh, that half of the population, women, were uh, uh, prevented from developing their, their intellectual uh, uh, faculties, were con confined to the house, uh, that they were uh, sexually uh, harassed and uh, demeaned in ways that we no longer tolerate the fact that gay people were uh, imprisoned for um, private sexual activities, the fact that uh, racial minorities were second-class citizens, to say nothing of being uh, enslaved. The fact that heretics used to be burned at the stake, and that doesn't happen so much anymore. Uh, so yes, there's been there's been tremendous moral progress as well as the material progress. And that ties into the part about uh, what, you, what you covered in a whole book, "The Better Angels of Our Nature," is the decline in violence and crime, uh, which you know I think we're we're we've lived through the big decline from you know the the crime wave of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and that there's a big decline from from then. But that's an even longer term trend. 
that violence and force in society has has declined uh, in most of the world. Uh, indeed, and you know, not as with most many of these developments, the decline has not been monotonic in the right. sense of always down, 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 down. There are blips, and sometimes, as in the case of the two world wars, rather you know, sickening spikes. Mm -hmm. But um, but but yes, in pretty much any form of violence that you can uh, measure, uh, it has declined over the course of history. And in in this decade, we're probably living in the most peaceful era in human existence, which of course doesn't mean that violence has vanished from the face of the earth. Probably never will, uh, but there's much, much less of it. Now, that brings me to the question of, you know, just this simple outlook of realizing how much better we have it now than we used to has, an, a, a, I think, a surprising number of, of consequences when you look at politics or public policy. Like, how would you deal with the question of crime if you realize that we're not in a crime wave, that we're not in a violent society, that violence is much lower than, than it has ever been? Indeed. Uh, and people almost always think that crime is increasing, even when it's decreasing by a lot, as it did in the United States between a couple of years ago when there was a very small uptick. But um, the, the rate of uh, homicide in the United States has fallen by more than half. In New York City, it's fallen by more than three quarters. So yeah. for one thing, it means that we're whatever we, we must have been doing something right. Interesting. We don't know exactly what it is. It's probably a combination of things. Uh, people got sick of crime uh, and, and implemented a number of measures. Uh, anyone who lived through the 70s and 80s would remember that mugging jokes and uh, mm -hmm. were just a staple of late night TV. You couldn't go into Central Park. Uh, there were whole chic parts of, of uh, New York that were no-go zones in the uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, life has been transformed in... Uh, and probably because the violence became so sickening that many measures were taken uh, and they, uh, a number of them may have pushed in the same direction, so there was no single cause of the violence decline. The expansion of the uh, police, the change in policing tactics, more data-driven policing. Uh, incarceration can't explain all of the crime decline, but it can explain some of it. Uh, more uh, community organizations that integrated the police with the store owners, the clergy, you know, the, the, the grandmothers, the, the neighborhood watch people, uh, a lot of things uh, pushed in the same direction. That sometimes happens with some with human progress. We, uh, It's a nuisance for social scientists who want to identify the cause. And often you do the analyses and there's just not one thing that pushed it around, but a lot of things pushing in the same direction. And the same is true of the decline of war. There's no single explanation as to why countries go to war less than they did in the uh, in, through most of human history. Well, the interesting thing is, that, you know, this is an example of how the recognizing the existence of progress doesn't mean being complacent. It means trying to figure out, well, we had progress because we did something. You know, we, we adopted some policies and, and, and took some actions that caused this thing to get better. And then you can use that to make sure you keep doing that to uh, also maybe apply those where it hasn't, you know, I, I used to live in Chicago. There's a lot of Chicago that still isn't that much better. It, yes. it could it could stand to learn maybe from places like New York and some other places that have had progress. So it's a matter of learning from that and figuring out what went right and then trying to apply that. Exactly. And that, that is the, the major thrust of uh, both, both of my books on mm -hmm. uh, documenting progress. Uh, first of all, it, what, what it shows is that we are not uh, consigned to uh, uh, or pinned to a fixed level of violence over history, even if you believe in human nature, as I do, mm -hmm. which, does, which I don't think changes. Human nature is complex. There are many uh, components to human nature. That's why I was delighted to steal the title, The Better Angels of Our Nature, from uh, Abraham Lincoln, because it captures the idea that there is more than one part to human nature, uh, and that sympathy, self-control, uh, moral norms, to try to push back against some of our, our inner demons, as I call them, like revenge, like dominance, like sadism. And uh, so it is possible, it's not romantic, it's not utopian to try to uh, improve the human condition. If you have a realistic uh, attitude, it is possible to make I incremental changes. But at the same time, uh, I, I certainly reject the, a kind of Victorian notion that progress is just built into the universe, that we're just fated to get better and better. That makes no sense scientifically. Uh, the, our understanding of the universe is that it's the exact opposite. The universe basically is trying to grind us down. 
and uh, it's only our own ingenuity applied in the to try to improve human welfare that allows us to eke out little increments of progress. But we've got the laws of physics, including the second law of thermodynamics that make you know, things fall apart, that make uh, things leak and wear down and, 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 and break. Uh, we've got uh, our legacy from evolution that means that we are saddled with a number of not so pleasant uh, traits like, like dominance, like vengeance, like, like sadism. So we're always pushing back against those. Uh, progress does not happen by itself, uh, but but it but it is possible. And as you say, it, it gives us the imperative to try to kind of reverse engineer human history to figure out well what does drive human progress when it does take place. What to what do we can we th uh, can we attribute the decline in warfare or the decline in crime or the decline in racial prejudice? What you just said leads us back to the. Part, the enlightenment part of your book, which is we're talking about what went right and what caused this, you attribute that to the enlightenment. So how can this be attributed to the ideas, to the intellectual movement of the 18th century of the enlightenment? So I, I, I single out the enlightenment, not so much that there were a bunch of real, really brilliant guys in the second half of the 18th century, though, though there were. There were, yeah. Uh, the point is that we, not that we should kind of look back to their wisdom and parse their words and treat them as secular prophets, but they did uh, unleash some ideas that uh, intermittently caught on uh, that, uh, that, that I, I do credit with uh, causing progress. One of them being science, namely we understand, try to understand how the world works so that we can uh, bend it to, the, to, to, to human needs. Um, we don't believe in miracles. We don't believe in uh, you know, predestination or, or any supernatural powers, but figure out the laws of nature. And moreover, we do it with the mindset that we none of us is vouchsafed with the truth by revelation, but, uh, but we have to allow our ideas to be falsified by the world, that all of our knowledge is tentative, that we should try to um, see which of our ideas are true or false by subjecting them to empirical test and to be prepared to be humbled by, uh, by reality. So one of the element uh, values is a science, uh, a, a superordinate value even prior to science is just reason. The fact that uh, we have to uh, use a rational analysis to understand our world, including ourselves, that um, divine revelation, scriptural authority, personal charisma, mysticism, uh, the, 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 the subjective feeling of certainty, Forget all those. That those are not ways of, uh, of, of uh, coming to correct conclusions. We've got to rigorously apply our strictest possible reasons. That's a second enlightenment ideal. And the third one, since those are just um, means to ends, mm -hmm. uh, the question is, what are the ends? What ought we to apply reason and science uh, toward? And another answer from which, more or less from the enlightenment, uh, is that it should go toward human well-being, whether it's formulated as the greatest good for the greatest number, or, or uh, using, uh, treating people as ends, not means, two slightly different versions of morality <laughs> both emerged from the Enlightenment. But in, in either case, that differs from, say, obeying divine commandments mm -hmm. or achieving feats of heroic greatness. It's not, human flourishing is not the only conceivable moral system, but it was one that was articulated during the Enlightenment and one that I think guided many of the steps that we took that, that actually did result in progress. Well, you talked about not wanting to uh, parse the uh, ideas of the Enlightenment thinkers too much. That's actually the one thing I would like to see more of in your book, uh, that uh, there wasn't enough as much delving into the ideas of the Enlightenment. And that, that brings me to an issue. It comes up late in your book where you talk about how we need a thin philosophical basis. I think it's talking about specifically the UN uh, Charter on Human, on, on human Rights that it had a thin philosophical basis. And the idea being that we don't want to have to get too deeply into the, the details of philosophy in order so we can get broad agreement from everyone. But I would like to see us in terms of defending and, and protecting the legacy of enlightenment, I'd like to see us get thicker on philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, cause you think of the, like the beginning of the declaration of independence, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal endowed with certain rights by their creator. That's, you know, a broad, statement that that you know jefferson said i was trying to say something that would have broad agreement above everybody in america 
but he's also summarizing a whole treatise of philosophy by John Locke and a whole philosophical tradition that goes back before Locke. Uh, so in a way, I'd like to see us spend more time debating the ideas of the Enlightenment philosophers and the ideas of people who came after and getting thicker on the philosophical basis mm -hmm. of this as a way of making, uh, defending and, and, and helping us to appreciate this legacy that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I don't disagree. Uh, I, I, and I think they can be pursued simultaneously. That is, you want to make sure that your intellectual foundation is, is uh, sound, that it doesn't contain contradictions, it can be defended against criticism. But then you also have to convey it, as Jefferson did so brilliantly, <laughs> in a few sentences. Uh, those sentences are among the, uh, my most famous ever written, my favorite ever written in the English language, precisely because you can, you can unpack them. There, you're, you're right. There's an awful lot of you know, cogitation and, and rational rationality behind them, but they were distilled into a few sentences that when you read them, they're uh, extraordinarily compelling. Yeah. And uh, uh, even if you don't delve into the, 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 the sub-basement as to what motivated yeah. them, they, uh, they, they intuitively appeal to a large number of people. Right. I also think that Americans were prepared for those words by decades of public debate in which a lot of those ideas were brought up. So it would be like, you know, Jefferson was coming out and giving a, a short, eloquent summary of ideas that people had already been discussing, you know, prior to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, uh, I think it was indeed it was Adams who talked about a revolution in the hearts and minds of the people. And he was referring to events, you know, that had happened in Boston and, you know, debates that had been going back for 10 or 15 years before the revolution. Indeed, and, and probably the most successful kind of intellectual progress can hide its tracks like that <laughs> so that you, you understand the fruits of all of those debates without necessarily having to recapitulate all the debates. Mm -hmm. and, and there are many, many examples. Like today, we just don't, we don't debate slavery. It's just kind of a done deal, foregone conclusion. But of course, as we know, there really were debates on slavery in, in the era. Fortunately, uh, the good guys won. And we don't have to recapitulate the debates, although it's always good to know what they were in case they become threatened anew, as any of these accomplishments can be, as we're seeing now in the renewal of, of, uh, of, of fascism, even of, of uh, Nazism. It's really good to have the uh, debates on why uh, extreme nationalism is not a... a a great idea, such as that it leads to world wars. <laughs> Why an authoritarian, a charismatic authoritarian is not the best way to run a country, however appealing he might be in the short run, because we know where that can lead. So uh, at, the, at the same time as we enjoy the, the, the bottom line, the upshot, the, uh, uh, the, the fruits of a, of a debate, uh, it's also be able, important to be able to go back to that substance when we need it. Right. And and on the other side, you know, there's the fact that we also have to continue to go over over and over again the problems with communism, the problems with central planning, the problems with the sort of authoritarian or dictatorial ideas on the left. Uh, and yeah, I, one of the, my favorite lines in your book was that uh, intellectuals hate progress and intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. Yeah, cause there's, so there's also a, 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 a need to protect that from the from from the from people coming from the left who are opposed to progress or opposed to enlightenment oh absolutely uh and of course the, the popularity of the term socialism mm -hmm. uh it would be a prime example mm -hmm. and now if, if this is a, a kind of a, an ignorant term for capitalism with a social safety net right. then it can be innocuous but if it's socialism in the sense of the union of soviet socialist republics <laughs> then that's a real problem <laughs> people need to be need to be reminded as to why that wasn't such a great idea. Yeah, and, and uh, doing, doing some research, actually, on the, I was trying to track down the origin of the word socialism. And from what I could tell, it came from Henri de Saint-Simon, the early 19th century French intellectual. And he meant it as a um, an opposite, not to capitalism, but to individualism. And so the idea that you would live only, and he his, his, the person who sort of adopted that uh, was, um, uh, oh boy, I'm going to blank out on his name. Uh, there's a guy who coined the word altruism, but what he meant by it was uh, August, August Comte. Comte. August Comte. I knew it would come to me. Uh, he he meant it as you have no right to any personal desires, any personal interests. You live only for the sake of the collective. It was sort of a, a precursor of Soviet-style Marxism. Uh, 
And that was, you know, one of the original meanings of socialism uh, in the way it was coined was this idea, the individual has no rights and, and no, um, no entitlement, no moral entitlement to, to, to think about his own life and his own well-being. Yes, that kind of uh, uh, notion of a superorganism. Right, yeah. That human is to a society the way a the cell of a body is to the body as a, as a whole. And, and there's it, actually a chilling passage from 1984 in which O'Brien explains to Winston Smith that the individual is just like um, uh, uh, skin scale, cells that get left off right. uh, for the benefit of the organism. And, so, and, and indeed, the Lockean and Jeffersonian idea of, of uh, uh, democracy as coming out of a social contract where we do surrender certain rights for the, the uh, our, our own benefit, and mm -hmm. everyone does so, uh, that government is uh, a means to the end of maximizing human rights and human well-being is an alternative to the idea that we're just in, uh, indistinguishable parts of a, a larger whole. Right. Now... Um, the the irony I find is that politically, when we talk about left versus right, you know, both these sides hate each other, but to a large extent, they both derive their basis uh, from the romantic philosophers' backlash against the Enlightenment. There's different variations on that backlash against Enlightenment ideas. I, I think that that that's true. That there's um, indeed that the counter Enlightenment ideas. Right. Uh, and, uh, one of them being that a society is an organic whole, that the individual is a fiction. This is the uh, inverse, the mirror image of the Jeffersonian idea that the society, that especially government, exists as a means to the end of promoting individual welfare. Right. But you could turn it on its head and say that the thing that really exists is not the individual, where culture is just the individuals in interaction, but that the culture is the real thing and that the individual are just uh, um, spare individual parts. Okay. Uh, also, the, the, the promotion of um, solidarity to a, uh, a, a whole a coalition, a tribe, uh, as the, the, the foremost good and that, the, that progress consists of struggle where the um, good people triumph over the evil people as opposed to the idea that progress consists of solving problems and the problems will always be with us and we always need our ingenuity to, to uh, advance. Uh, the, uh, um, but yes, there are both left-wing and right-wing versions of, of romanticism, of uh, communitarianism, of superorganism being thinking. I also think one of the essential ideas of romanticism too was the idea that uh, you know, there's this emphasis on authenticity and it's the idea that uh, emotions are authentic. There are real selves. They connect us to the reality of the world, and reason is artificial and just gets in the way. So it was a backlash, not just against individual well-being, but also against the very use of reason, uh, as opposed to relying on instinct or emotion or tradition. Uh, indeed, uh, the idea that that reason is necessarily cold and anti-human and calculating and cannot accommodate human uh, emotions and feelings, all of which are non sequiturs. Reason <laughs> is simply the refinement of what you're doing when you do anything in terms of verbal argument, including the role of reason itself. <laughs> what are you doing? You do reason. Yeah. Uh, all of these arguments are themselves couched in reason. You can do it well, you can do it bad badly, but the one thing you cannot do is escape it. And of course, reason can, must take into account human emotion, human well-being, human comforts, human satisfaction. Uh, reason can't dictate that those are the aims to which reason is put. But uh, given that we agree that it's better for people to live than to die, to be healthy than sick, to be well-fed than starving, then we can deploy reason in order to maximize those human goods. You know, for those of us who are grateful to the legacy of the Enlightenment and want to defend it, I guess that the big question is, how do you push back against the romanticism? Uh, now, for example, as we speak right now, uh, everybody is anticipating the final episode of Game of Thrones, which is coming up <laughs> next Sunday, which really strikes me as like, you know, pe millions of people tuning in every Sunday to watch a broadcast from the pre-Enlightenment world. Right? It's, it's, it's a <laughs> yes. world of force and violence and divine right of kings and, and, and conquest and torture and all these things uh, and poverty, which are which which we vanquish. But we go back to it, uh, perversely go back to it in our entertainment. It, you know, it's not bad if it's a reminder of how things uh, <laughs> once were. Um, and there's not, nothing wrong with that either. 
um, as long as we keep in mind that you you really would not want to live there <laughs> if you had the choice. Uh, but I, mean, I think there's the sense, you know, I, I got this, you know, in your book a little bit, and, and Jonah Goldberg also wrote a book about the Enlightenment uh, from a sort of a more, you know, it's interesting that he found it more co consistent with 20th century conservatism, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, which, which are, of course, is another string coming out of the Enlightenment. But um, the idea that that romanticism has been more artistically appealing or more poetic and in some ways has sort of captured people's hearts while we're out trying to capture people's brains. It's true that there's not a whole lot of great art that is uh, utopian or optimistic that uh, dystopias make for much better uh, fiction. Uh, uh, literature is very much about human conflict mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and uh, problems and tragedies. So if you're, certainly if you're fighting it, the, the battle on the territory of, of the arts, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not as easy. Although there can be, of course, uplifting, oh, yeah. soaring rhetoric. Uh, there are occasional uh, 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 stories set in the future that are uh, optimistic and forward-looking. Star Trek being right. an example, the original. The Although Star I think Trek. they sort of backed Maybe. off from that a little bit in the more recent versions. It's gotten a little darker because that's the trend. That's the cultural trend. True enough, yes. Uh, well, well, actually, one thing I have sort of bone to pick with you because uh, when you were talking about the sort of the romantic and, and the Nietzschean aspect, you, you put Ayn Rand as somebody in the Nietzschean category. And that's that's something I'm a bit of an expert on. I, I actually think that – I'll send you some links on this – that she is actually much more – in the philosophically in the substance of her philosophy very much in the enlightenment camp uh but i think people are deceived by that because they react i think to her literary style because in her literary style she she described herself as a romantic so she was sort of literarily a romantic but i think that's an interesting answer to this because what she did in some of her novels is she would write these sort of romantic you know heroic uh, struggle where the heroes were uh, somebody runs a railroad and a guy who invents a new kind of metal alloy. So it's these sort of enlightenment style uh, technological mm. and scientific achievements, but given a romanticized treatment. And I, I think maybe I want to just propose that, that that would be part of the answer to this is to find the romanticism in or to romanticize the kind of achievements that the enlightenment made possible. Well, I certainly think that, that deploying the, um, the, the emotions of uh, admiration of the of the genuinely praiseworthy of the um, the inventors and the scientists and the humanitarians and the and the, indeed the entrepreneurs and the forward looking leaders is is, is certainly something a, a literary device that, that that should be exploited. My comments on on, on Rand. I mean, there. Uh, as with most thinkers, she's obviously a complex thinker. She went through her own trajectory in, in her life. Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is that there was some scholarship that, that, that showed that in some of the uh, er, earlier drafts of her writings, she had epigraphs from Nietzsche, which she then uh, excised, mm -hmm. that there were uh, tropes, there were figures of speech uh, that she that could be traced back to, to Nietzsche. She may have thought the better of it, but certainly <laughs> in her, her early development. Well, she, did, she did talk about that actually a little bit in the introduction. Uh, she did a 25th anniversary edition of The Fountainhead, where she wrote about how she originally included a, a quote from Nietzsche, and she decided not to because of her disagreement with his philosophy. Ah. And she talked about him being a great poet, and she liked him, the poetry and the sense of self-assertiveness that he gave, but that she well, I would... rejected the philosophy. Yes, I, I, he, he was certainly a great stylist. You cannot get that away. <laughs> I don't know if, if Rand would have uh, signed on to something like the greatest good for the greatest number. Oh, well, uh, she, no, I think she I don't think she would have. But that's, you know, that's somewhat different from the more Lockean idea of uh, every, of all men being created equal and having equal rights. Uh, uh, so, yes. Yeah. So, you know, there, I mean, there is the, I think the problem, even though in, in many regards, I'm a, you know, a classical liberal and a strong advocate of, of, uh, of, of free markets. At the same time, there is just a realization that with a free market, there are going to be people who have nothing to offer in the marketplace uh, for reasons of innate endowment, luck, and some, sometimes character. Mm -hmm. And uh, a modern society just isn't going to let uh, uh, the, the little match girl freeze to death or uh, uh, grandma sleep on the floor of a bar that she sweeps out because uh, you know, her husband died and she doesn't have a pension. And it, it's a, a fact that... 
regardless even of the morality of whether of how big a social safety net that we need, one discovery that I came across in, in writing uh, Enlightenment Now was that 100% of developed countries have a social safety net, a well-developed one, anywhere from 20% to 30% of GDP being uh, allocated to social spending, that as societies develop, as they escape from poverty, they become more munificent in their, their social welfare programs. So while it, it may not be impossible for there to be a wealthy country without a, a, a robust uh, social welfare system, the, the planet Earth has not seen one. And that mm -hmm. might be, I think that's, that might be telling us something. Well, I, I think it's possible to have the benefits of this wealth accrue to many more people. I mean, I think the welfare state is only really possible to consider because of the enormous achievements of capitalism. You know, the idea that you could oh, have, sure. you know, the idea you could have distributed all these, all these good, uh, all these goods to people. You know, to three hundred years ago, there wouldn't have been the goods to distribute. Totally, no, no, I, I have complete agreement, and uh, that's why I think some of the contemporary debates between the kind of the hard libertarians and the, the hard socialists uh, may be misconceived. And a lot of the uh, allergy that intellectuals have to even the concept of capitalism comes from uh, a form of capitalism that doesn't exist, namely the, the, the uh, kind of extreme Randian stereotype of an ultra-individualist society that with no provision for the the, the, the sick, the elderly, the, the poor. Um, and it, there, it is an interesting fact that that kind of capitalism just does not exist. Uh, now, uh, granted, what does exist could not exist, but for the ability of capitalism to generate mammoth amounts of wealth, mm -hmm. and for which we must be grateful. We can afford a social safety net because we've got all this wealth to redistribute. But there doesn't exist a society that doesn't have such a, a structure in place. I would also argue, though, that a lot of that anti-capitalism is also generated by a sort of Dickensian caricature of the way capitalism was that that doesn't actually necessarily correspond to the way it really was. And, for example, there were enormous amounts of, of uh, private charity uh, that was generated from the wealth created by the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so, you know, I think the issue we can talk about the hard libertarian, of which I am, you know, more on that end of things. Uh, but the main thing, I want, I want to get back to the larger issues of the ways of defending and reclaiming and and promoting awareness of enlightenment ideas. So what do you think is the best solution for doing that? Yes. Yeah, so how to uh, how to how to make these things you know, go viral and have an influence is um, <laughs> not something I can claim expertise on other than to do what I try to do, namely to state the case for progress as convincingly as I can, and to try to reverse engineer it and see what are the ideas that gave it to us. Now, granted, that's not the same as crafting uh, soaring rhetoric, uh, uh, viral memes, uh, networks of, of, of influence, messaging strategies, where I'm, uh, it's kind of a, I, I've reached my level of incompetence, as they used to say, <laughs> is the Peter principle. Uh, uh, but what I hope is that by stating the case in, in, in a way that I hope is persuasive, I can recruit people who are more expert at popular persuasion than I am to help spread the message, probably in, in diverse ways, because people in different fa factions and subcultures might respond to different ways of stating the case. I'd like to see a hit television show that could take the excitement and adventure and that that sense and apply it to something more benevolent than some than what you see in games of a more benevolent world and more progress. And, uh, you know, one something you said earlier that that human nature includes reason. It includes the ability to solve problems, the ability to create technology, the ability to write the Declaration of Independence. That's all part of human nature, too. Indeed, uh, and those are the those are the better angels of our nature, and that's what we uh, ought to uh, maximize and appeal to in order to eke out increments of progress in a universe that doesn't really care about our well-being. Mm. My guest today has been Stephen Pinker, author of Enlightenment Now: The Case for Reason, Science, Human and, Humanism, and Progress. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me. If you found this conversation interesting, you can follow us on YouTube. You can follow our podcast. You can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash Salon of the Refused. And you can always find more ideas and analysis at the Trzinski Letter, trzinskiletter.com.
I'm Rob Trasinski. Thank you for listening.